Hey everybody, how's it going? Sorry for the little bit of delay. We had some audio trouble there, but we are ready to go now. I've got a really great guest. Uh, he doesn't need any introduction for those who are familiar with Twitter. Uh, he's somebody who is famous for having excellent threads and also writes some really excellent fiction. And I'm pretty excited to be talking to him this afternoon. So Zero HP Lovecraft, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me, and I apologize for the delays. Oh, no problem. Uh, so one of the things I always uh, start out with, because I'm always interested in how people kind of got started with their creative process and what they're doing, uh, how did you get started in writing or you know putting the Twitter threads together? I don't know which preceded which. Did you start out kind of writing these, comp these uh, threads on Twitter? Did you start with the fiction, you know, how did you start uh, doing what you're doing now? Uh, yeah, I saw me and uh, I was sort of immediately shocked, uh, taken aback by its popularity. And then I just started sharing my thoughts and I was also shocked at the popularity of that. But as I became aware of what I was doing, I chose to continue. And uh, yes, every now and then I'm still sort of surprised that people want to hear from me. I guess some don't. Well, I, th I think it's really interesting because, uh, like I said, uh, obviously, uh, you've got some, some really interesting threads and the way you layer things in is really fantastic but also then the way you write your fiction is also particularly unique you uh introduce a lot of different elements uh, your your newest story uh which people should definitely read i finished it a few days ago it's called uh, don't make me think and if you if for some reason you're not following um uh zero hp or if you have not been reading his work i've got all the links below the video uh, but your newest one incorporates like a, a whole uh, set of emojis, like a, a whole different language that goes along with the text as you follow through. And so I, I think that really makes your writing very unique. Uh, what, what, do you, uh, what do you think when you're coming up with these ideas about how to incorporate different technologies or different ways to tell the story that kind of only work in kind of the digital environment? I don't really have a process around it. It's, it's something that comes to me intuitively, often halfway through the work, a uh, haphazard approach to the emoji. But as I was filling it out and thinking on some of the Orientalist themes of the work, I realized that I should try to be more alphabetical in my approach to the emoji. And I used sort of the way Chinese words are constructed a little bit as a reference. But uh, I have many other ideas about how to exploit a purely digital milieu, some of which are easier than others. Yeah, I imagine that one had to be quite the bear to, uh, uh, to like edit and everything. Uh, but but it certainly makes it a very unique experience. Yes, it was laborious. And I knew from the start that I was doing all of that work mostly to be greeted by complaints. One commenter said, I wish the author had been more courteous and left this out, which cracked me up. To frame a matter of discourtesy was very funny to me. <laughs> so uh, your your uh, work definitely has a theme of kind of a mix of, of science fiction and horror. Uh, is that are, are is that kind of the the genre that you've always wanted to work in, or did you start somewhere else and find kind of a a voice in that? What kind of led you to to kind of focus in those areas? I always wanted to write uh, science fiction, but the specifically horrorist focus uh, 
came much later for me. I was inspired especially by the writings of Nick Land, and he actually had a blog post on Xeno Systems about what he called horrorism, which he described as the understanding that there is no escape and nothing you do can possibly work. I'm not really that bleak in my personal outlook, but when I read H.P. Lovecraft and I combined it with my existing sensibilities, I found that this sort of hard sci-fi horror approach was a very natural fit for me. Well, I think anyone who's tried to read uh, Fang Numina can probably uh, appreciate horror and Nick Land. Um, but uh, uh, when when you uh, start thinking uh, through, I guess, the horror genre as it stands today, uh, I, I, don't, I wouldn't be the first person to make the observation that it seems like people are having a lot of difficulty writing um, good horror. And that's one of the reasons your work stands out. Uh, and, and I think a lot of times it's because they're trying to work messages or different things that don't necessarily fit into the horror genre in there. Do you think, what do you think about the state of kind of uh, that genre in general? And do you think there's something about what you're doing specifically that kind of helps bring something new to it? To be honest, I barely read it. I believe strongly in the idea of found horror, which is horror is discovered in everyday life, in mundane places, in places that are not specifically designated as horrific. I, I think you can find everywhere you look and you can find it in almost every story, whether that story is a romantic comedy or a grim, dark, uh, gritty, serial, like, Horror is everywhere, if you have the right temperament. I think that lots of people say my work is polemical, even the fiction, and some of it is. But what maybe makes my voice a little different is that I am very much in tune with my emotion of disgust, which is very similar to horror. And progressive morality is sort of all about suppressing the disgust instinct and it believes that disgust is actually uh a sin on the behalf of a person who is disgusted that if you feel disgust that's something that's wrong with you and i don't think that so i listen to my sense of disgust and i write about what it tells me yeah that's interesting that's an interesting way to put that because i have heard you know i've heard a couple different people give good you know do good video essays and things about why horror is more successful as a right wing kind of genre or is is kind of inherently right wing because it's dealing with kind of the, the kind of the, the darkness of human nature and it, it requires accepting or, or at least recognizing things that you cannot fully grasp or control and kind of being subject to those forces, uh, which is something that, uh, you know, is not necessarily, uh, you know, something progressives are often willing to touch, but I had never specifically heard it described with the discuss mechanism, which is, that is very interesting. And I think there's, there's a good point to that. Do you think that, um, that, that horror is better served from that kind of more right-wing perspective because uh, like like some people have said that it does allow you to interface more organically with kind of uh, the, those bigger things beyond your control, you know, recognizing uh, things that exist in the world and are kind of ancient and unknowable? Well, I've talked about this a little bit before that I think there is both such thing as left-wing and right-wing horror. And with left-wing horror, it's about finding something internal that you're afraid of. It's about walls that are keeping something in. And with right-wing horror, it's about something external that you're afraid of. It's walls that are keeping something out. So a left-wing horror story is one where the protagonist himself is evil, 
but maybe there's all these things that are uh, social norms or life circumstances are constraining that evil and keeping it in. And so for left-wing horror, it's about that evil finding its way out. But with right-wing horror, it's the opposite. It's, it's that there are walls protecting you and something breaches the wall. But we are, we are marinated in left-wing horror now. So I think that the right-wing type is a bit more novel. It's fresh. No, absolutely. And that actually leads me into the next area I wanted to talk to you about. A, a lot of people uh, who end up on the right, uh, you know, they, they say, okay, we've got, you know, engineers or we've got, uh, you know, uh, business guys, but, uh, you know, they're always limiting the lack of cultural production on the right, the lack of creativity, the lack of creative minds. And, so I, I wonder, do you think that there's something innate about kind of the right wing mindset that does inhibit uh, that creativity? Or do you think that it's just the, the current kind of cultural constraints that there or that maybe there isn't uh, the right, um, you know, the, the right people aren't being exposed? What do, you, do you think that there's uh, something to kind of the, the mindset of right wing people? Or do you think that it's, it's just kind of situational and it's a momentary thing? I think there is some gatekeeping that occurs, especially at the level of like publishing houses or movie production studios and that kind of thing. But I also think that if there is a mindset that is stultifying to creativity, it's not so much a right wing mindset as a as a centrist or a conservative mindset. So we imagine that conservative people are on the right. I don't actually believe that is correct. I believe that if you're conservative, it means you sort of want to stay with what you know, and you want to stay safely in the middle of the herd. These people are painted as right wing, but, but is as and countercultural, and there will always be creative energy in countercultural spaces, be they left wing or right wing. So, I think that Republicans are probably about as incapable of creativity as Democrats. Both are more or less comfortably in the center of the herd, but people on the edges are more able to battle these things. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, because even the establishment, um, you know, Democrats, at least in name, can speak towards transgression or, you know, bring, kind of breaking out of the box, maybe they allow a little more creativity on their side or at least at least give lip service to the value of it. But because you have this, you know, uh, you, you have this inbuilt, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, aversion to that on uh, what is considered the cultural right, especially in America, you don't you you see them being more careful about the create kind of creativity they'll embrace. So even when you do get right wing creatives, oftentimes you have people, if not censoring, at least not embracing and encouraging or, you know, uh, uh, pa maybe patronizing in the way that they would w when it's a, a left wing creative. And that's something that because I like you said, when I when I see some of those spaces on the right, I do see creativity. I do see people who are doing interesting things, but it feels like they don't maybe get, you know, the support or the excitement or the energy around them as much as they would if they were left wing. Uh, but yeah, that said, uh, the next thing I wanted to ask you about uh, was uh, when you, uh, obviously uh, Lovecraft is a big influence. And like you said, Nick Land, those are two, uh, bo those are two uh, people who you really brought into your work. Is there anyone else's work or any other styles that have, you know, encouraged what you're doing now? So, 
certainly. Uh, my biggest influence, contra my pseudonym, is actually Borges. I think all of my stories refer to Borges in more ways than to Lovecraft. I've said as much. Uh, for me, he is simply my favorite writer, and he occupies a, a philosophical and literary space that I also want to share. Yeah, excellent. No, and I, uh, you know, someone mentioned it, and I, I couldn't have put my finger on it. And I, I hope you take it as a compliment. But I, I, I always think of uh, your stories a little bit as like if Philip K. Dick had added more horror elements in. Uh, which for me is high praise. I love Phil, Philip K. Dick. So, <laughs> but uh, but for me, I, when I when I'm uh, looking at your stuff, that's definitely uh, someone someone I think of when I'm reading. Uh, sorry, you cut out there for me. I, I oh that. no problem. Uh, no, I was just I was just saying uh, uh, when when I've uh, read your stuff. Uh, someone mentioned uh, when they were looking at, at uh, your your latest on uh, Twitter, they mentioned uh, Philip K. Dick, and if you had added horror elements kind of into that, and uh, that that's definitely one of my favorite sci-fi uh, authors. So I hope you take that as a compliment. But uh, your your that style does kind of remind me a little bit of uh, if you had brought those elements into Philip K. Dick. Yes, I I have actually only read one story by Philip K. Dick, though I have seen a couple of movies based on his movies. And thinking this year for Halloween, I will probably rebrand as Philip K. Dick Flattening just for a few days. <laughs> uh, but I'm not extremely familiar with his work. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those guys who has been... Uh, made into so many movies, like you said, and and so and there are some great movies, of course. But uh, if people haven't read the books, uh, it's it's always worth it. Particularly, uh, Man of the High Castle uh, is one of those uh, that the way he writes in the voices uh, are is is very interesting. The the different occupied parts of America, he almost writes as if the occupied people think in the thought patterns uh, of their or the speaking patterns of their. Uh, occupiers, which is a very interesting way he does that. But, uh, uh, but, but yeah, I think it's it's for people who have not read his his work and have only seen, you know, he did, you know, Total Recall and Minority Report, and obviously, uh, you know, was the inspiration for Blade Runner and all these different things. But the the books are are excellent. Um, uh, but the, yeah, another thing I wanted to ask you about is I saw recently, I th you know, moved on to something I think we're both uh, interested in. Uh, uh, neo reactionary theory. I've uh, seen you make some comments recently about kind of the difference between Moldbug and Yarvin, and I wanted to kind of get a little deeper into that. But would you mind uh, talking a little bit about how you first encountered neo reaction? I know you were talking about Nick Land here earlier, but how did you kind of come to that theory? When did that happen for you? it will probably come as no surprise to many that my first encounter with unqualified reservations was all the way back in 2009. And it happened when I was reading the blog from Chateau Hartiste, and he had Moldbug in his sidebar, and I clicked it and uh, expanded my mind. So I read that blog all the way until uh, Yarvin stopped posting. I think I went back and read the archives too. And I've been in this dissident space ever since, at least mentally. Yeah, you're you're one of the uh, very old school guys. I'm I'm a relative newcomer. I, I run into so many people who who have been aware uh, of Yarvin since the beginning, but I only read him in the last few years. So. So I'm relatively new, but one of the things that uh, you were saying that I thought was very interesting is you said that uh, mold, you know, when Yarvin was writing under Moldbug, it was almost like a different person. You, know, you said Moldbug and, and Yarvin are are almost entirely different people with writing, and I think you even said that Yarvin got to the point where Yarvin wasn't really writing even 
as a neo reactionary anymore. I wonder if you could go a little more into that. What you meant by that? Sure, and I want to preface this by saying that I have tremendous uh, respect for uh, Curtis Yarvin. Uh, even now, I, I, I think he's an important voice, and I still enjoy his writings. But the old mold bug, uh, he was younger, the world looked quite different, and it was much more focused on establishing a narrative in, a, in an entirely, not entirely, but in a much less known and much less explored space. So he had to gather a lot of primary materials. He quoted many different thinkers, historians. He found primary sources explaining uh, historical circumstances. And he made his case in a very intelligent and data-oriented way. Whereas uh, Yarvin, although he does recycle some of the, many of the same ideas, the writing is a little bit simpler. It's, you could say, much more polished, but it also, in my opinion, lacks the, the subversive energy and the sense of imminence that, uh, that Old Moldbug did. But, but much is still the same. In both, he advocates for a course of, of passivism, of reactionary inaction, which is one of the main things he's criticized for uh, as well. Many people want a politics of action, no matter what that action is. Uh, it's very, very important to them that we do something. And uh, that's antithetical to his project. Yeah, and I'm wondering what you think about that, because that is, like you said, the, where he gets his most criticism. It is, uh, you know, especially what I hear most often is that, you know, neo-reactionaries are just, it's just an intellectual, it's just a way to intellectualize cowardice or doing nothing. Uh, I don't think that's fair. I think that there is a very strong uh, set of points that he's making around why it's it's bad to waste energy or to put it somewhere it doesn't belong how it actually counters uh the things that you want to do uh though i will say at some point there are things that he says that i i think are too far when he says you basically just need to act uh like an expat in your own country i do think that at that point you are then actually just crossing from you, know, you you are almost embracing the rootlessness uh, of of modernity, you know, rather than um, you know finding finding ways to work against it. Uh, but what do you think about his you know his kind of pacifist solutions? Do you think that they're mostly correct, or are there things he gets wrong there? I have tended to side with the Bronze Age pervert when it comes to questions of what effective action might be. The, the, the dilemma is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you ever say this action cannot work, you're almost certainly right. That doesn't mean that believing in yourself will make your course of action correct, but believing in yourself is a necessary, though not sufficient ingredient of any kind of success. So I like that he advocates analysis and caution. I think, though, that there, there does come a moment when one must be very decisive. I don't know what that moment is. And one of the attributes of a great leader is having the judgment to identify that moment. I will also say, at risk of being too inflammatory for those who know, that there are times when Yarvin's blog risks becoming one more ordeal of civility, if you take my meaning. Mm. Yeah, I feel like, um, I, I know you're familiar with Lomez on Twitter, and uh, I think he strikes a good balance. I think he he, he strikes a good balance between, you know, being wise and biding your time, but also 
not just writing off everything you know you 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 can't possibly win if you're if you're always just waiting um but but not being foolish i think is uh, you know striking that balance is is the kind of the way to go i think Uh, but you you reference yes. back there. There is a and... very fine line between caution and paladin. Right, absolutely. Uh, but speaking of someone who's not uh, you know not, not always from the cautious school, you you uh, mentioned uh, Bap there, Bronze Age uh, pervert for those who are unfamiliar, and it was a uh, you know big deal on Twitter this week when uh, his account was kind of finally put out of commission. Uh, a lot of uh, people kind of climbing out of the woodwork ready to, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, now stand over the corpse of that account and, and finally, you know, speak their piece. What do you think about the banning? What do you think that means uh, for both the right and Twitter? And what do you think about the reaction from kind of different corners of, uh, of Twitter there? For my part, that is still, one of the best showing points that we have and uh, obviously I support him completely. I think that uh, ultimately these things do have to break out of their containment zones. I don't know what form that will take but if you want to see what people really think of you on Twitter, deactivate your account for three days it will have almost the same effect as getting banned. Mm, interesting. Yeah, no, I certainly saw some some pretty laughable reactions. I saw, you know, some of the uh, disaffected socialist crowd suddenly coming up and saying, you know, uh, you know, the the right is no real threat to the to the system, and we're the ones who you know are really going to make a difference. And you know, BAP and 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 anyone who follows him are just. You know, they're just shows that show they're just uh, pawns. And I, I found that really hilarious that people with, you know, opinions handed to them by their college professors that they could hold in any corporate boardroom or high level position with almost zero pushback or talking about how the people who are getting banned are, are not the real threats to the system. And they are. I, I thought that was pretty laughable. Yes, today I read an article in The Guardian which said that socialism is challenging to existing structures of power in a way that politics of race and sexuality are not. And this is exactly what every socialist on Twitter who thinks they're edgy says. But it's like, your words are printed verbatim in the biggest newspapers, at the cognitive dissonance there, it just it can't be defeated by by argumentation. No, most certainly not. There, it's one of those things that either people observe it and they understand the truth, or or they don't. And you're certainly not going to argue them out of that position at all. Um, but I, like I said, I just thought it was very interesting. And you had a great uh, you had a great thread talking about uh, you know Bronze Age pervert because you know. I, I, He's not, you know, uh, directly in my wheelhouse, but he's one of those guys. I, I like what you said, you know, um, by by kind of investing in everyone and and kind of promoting and, and giving a, a kind of a, a positive force for people. Uh, it kind of brought people together. You know, uh, he started retweeting my account when I had, you know, 3000 followers or something. And uh, and uh, I would be nowhere near as successful w without, you know, uh, guys like him. So uh, it is somebody who, even if you didn't agree with hundred percent with whatever he was saying, it was a, like you said, it was a, a, a kind of a point that kind of connected the community and, uh, and, and built it in a way that few other accounts did. I don't even uh, know how he did it. I, and yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. By all means, I, I wanted to hear what you said. I thought I wasn't sure if I, you were lagging or, or what that was. Yeah. So. yeah. No, I, I, I don't know how he did it because his judgment was consistently pretty good. It was 
very rare that I would see someone followed by BAP who would say something that was subversive or uh, against my my intuitions or my sense of what's right and wrong. And it's very impressive that he could do that, that he could make that judgment so many times for so many people uh, in, a, in, in a way that created that community. I've thought about, could I replicate his feet? And honestly, I don't know if I, I don't think I could. Yeah, no, it was, it's definitely very interesting. And uh, it, I know he's moved over to Telegram. I, I hate Telegram, so I, I don't use it. But if people want to uh, uh, to follow him there, they should definitely check that out. There's a lot of people, guys like Morgoth and the Distributist, who are no longer on Twitter, but you, you can find over there. So if, if you're looking to uh, stay in contact. And I think there are Twitter accounts that are just reposting uh, what he, he puts there, but obviously not having him directly on the platform it, there there is a difference there but you can still find uh find his content if you're looking for it uh but the next thing i wanted to ask you about is uh yes uh, it's you know, well i'm sorry go ahead oh no no go ahead go ahead yeah, I think we've just got a slight delay, so I'm not waiting long enough for your your uh, responses. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to talk over you. But uh, no, the next thing uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit wa- about was uh, where you think um, things are going to go creatively and culturally. Obviously, I know that's a that's a broad question, but when we look at kind of just the the over you know uh, overwrought. Uh, stuff that's being produced in Hollywood and literature and music and everything else right now. Uh, we're, we're really seeing the, the constant uh, what happens when you just have this prepackaged culture that's chock full of these really trite political messages uh, and is just wearing people out. I know we talked a little bit on where, you know, creative energy is and uh, you know, you know how it can be. Uh, you know what people on the right can do, but do you see um, a, a? Do you think that there'll be a significant uh, kind of increase in people searching for uh, things that are coming from those kind of outside of progressivism? And if so, do you think it's going to be purely in kind of this internet right wing phenomenon, or do you think we'll see it in kind of other avenues as well? the creative works of, of the present to the work of the great works or of the works of the day can make it even you know 10 years 20 years a century later and if you think about like if you go back five centuries can you name more than one or two books from that time? Maybe you can, because you exist in an unusual discursive base. But I don't think most people could. I'm not sure I could. Uh, so I, I can't make any broad prognostications about that. I think that most work just falls by the wayside and always will. And all anyone can do is try to be one of the, to be one of the exceptional ones. No, I think that's true. Yeah, we we I, I guess we're all looking for the next big work, the next big movement, the the landmark that's going to carry through the ages. But the truth is that majority of culture and and art is you know is of its moment and 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 doesn't necessarily you know uh, become epic or breakthrough. And and I guess it's probably valuable for people and content creators and everyone to remember that that that's you know that it, you don't while you hope that someone is reaching for the stars or knocking out a part is going to define kind of the next uh, you know cultural movement that's not necessarily what the majority of the thing these kind of things uh produce that's not what they happen or how people set out to make them and and you have to be able to 
to, to be able to aim small to, you know, be able to just make something and put it out there uh, and, and let people enjoy it. And if it grows from there, that's great. Um, but if you're, if you're always just swinging for the fences and you're only looking for that big move, then uh, you might miss some really great stuff. Yes. And in a sense, choosing to exist on the fringe or in some kind of vanguard is making a risky bet on the ability to persist your work in the future. Because the most sort of middle of the road stuff is almost guaranteed not to endure. But if you do talk about defining a movement, an aesthetic movement, I mean specifically, then you have to do some things well outside of prevailing norms. But most will still fail. Sure, absolutely. It, well, and that you know that brings me something to something that I should have asked when we were talking about Yarvin before. But I, I wanted to ask you and kind of pick your brain on what do you think of the mainstreaming of Yarvin and kind of you know the basic neo reactionary ideas. You've got Fox News hosts referencing the cathedral. You've got uh, Tucker Carlson talking about how much he likes Yarvin when he's talking to Anton. Uh, what do you think about that? What, how, how do you think that that will get applied? Is it, is it all going to get hollowed out and, and watered down for the mainstream? Is there going to kind of be a connective bridge or, you know, what, what do you, what do you think is going to be happening with that? Tucker himself is barely tolerated within the Overton window. And, it's sometimes surprising that he's allowed to do his show at all. But you'll notice the really dangerous topics, the ones that actually mattered, uh, and I'm talking about the events of about six months ago, seven months ago, he was silent at the time it could have mattered. And that's, look, he's trying to put bread on his table the same as everyone else. Uh, but you cannot rely on a cable news figure, even if he brings some of this, these dissident voices in. What we want, what we hope, is the tip. I tend to be pessimistic about it, but I'm, it's a little too soon to say. Yeah, you certainly don't want to. Um, you certainly don't want it to, like you said, to hang on one uh, news host. The thing that I think is more interesting to me is really that some of the more establishment uh, right wing um, uh, kind of not academia, but but the you know the think tanks, the idea spaces. Uh, places like the Claremont Institute and kind of others uh, like that, the intelligentsia uh, seem to be more willing to uh, to interact with those ideas, and I think that matters far more than uh, than a than a Fox News host. Uh, you know, well, well, it, it would be hilarious to you know have uh, my grandpa talking about uh, the the cathedral. Uh, I I much more interested in the way that kind of thought leaders on the right seem to be more willing to talk about or interact uh, with those ideas. Cause in the end of the day, they're the ones, if anyone who's going to probably carry that into a place where it matters. Yes. I don't believe that there is anyone in the GOP who is going to be able to help us in any way at this time, but it is very interesting to watch these ideas that were almost unheard of 10 years ago, percolating out a little bit because really the, the right-wing thinkers, the conservative thinkers have no choice. There's no other intellectual center they can go to. They're starting to see that they can either become that stone toss comic where you know they get a bunch of piercings and blue hair and go saying that, uh, neo-leninists are the real transphobes yeah. that's one path 
and then the other one is to look here. So which way, Western GOP? Yeah, no, I 100% agree that uh, as it exists now, the Republican Party is uh, is is far more of a stumbling block than it is anything that's going to help, uh, you know, people kind of uh, of our persuasion. But I do think it, like I said, I, I do think that it's interesting that um, these these think tanks, these uh, the intelligentsia, they like I said, they don't really have anywhere else to go. No one who came up through their the university system or came through you know their different organizations was really allowed to think in these directions and so there's an entire like kind of uh, political uh, thought architecture that exists outside the system and can only really be found over there and for once uh, the right has to actually like, interface with you know it's radicals really this is something the left does all the time you know they take ideas from their radicals and, and they don't always implement them 100%, but it gives them, you know, a lifeblood. It gives them new ideas. It lets them circulate in new talent, uh, which is, I think a massive advantage for the left that the right has simply not had the option to do, but it's gotten to the point where these people, like you said, are so desperate that they kind of have to come and talk to uh, people like Yarvin because there's really nothing uh, that's challenging or, or interesting or changing anything uh, in, in kind of the normal st uh, structures of the uh, right-wing intelligentsia. Have you, you probably have listened to a talk by Jonathan Bowden on vanguardism, and this is exactly the point that he raises in that talk that the left does draw their energy from their radicals and the right has so far refused to but i think the world could be very different if uh if they started to listen to their vanguard no absolutely and i think um i think that is really the question here is will will uh you know will enough people be willing to take the the next step and and you know uh put themselves out there to listen to the vanguard or will it just die because i think those really are kind of the only two options and and i'm glad to see at least some people seem to be willing to take those steps um but we have a few questions for you that i wanted to run through real quick let me grab some yes, of these this is chats. also why what are you doing on twitter Oh, sure, sure. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Please continue. Like I said, I'm sorry. I'm transitioning because I'm used to, and we just have this delay. So I keep talking over interesting things you're saying. Uh, you uh, Please go ahead with what you're saying with uh, Twitter there. Could you hear me before? I'm sorry. You, you were saying something about what you were doing on Twitter, and I wanted to hear that, but I, I spoke over you there. Yes. I was saying, people ask, what are you doing on Twitter? What are you going to accomplish by posting? You know, uh, why are you saying all of these things? And the answer is what we just discussed. I am trying to drag people kicking and screaming into the 17th century. Yes, absolutely. That's a good, that's a good uh, catchphrase there. I like that. All right. So let me grab some of these super chats real quick. We have the Prudentialist here. Uh, thank you, sir, for the support. And he said he just finished streaming. Looking forward to this. Yeah, guys, if you are not uh, subscribed to the Prudentialist at this point for some reason, make sure you're checking him out. Uh, we have the Doomgoy for $2 here. It says, uh, when is Tucker hopping on the stream? Oh, he'll be here soon, I'm sure. He's, he's probably waiting in the room. I should have let him in. Uh, let's see. Uh, there, here we go. Is an actual question. Uh, Marjan Walker says, good evening. Uh, what's Zero HP's take on the short Lovecraft biography written by Michael Hollenbeck or on Hollenbeck in general? Are you familiar 
with Hollenbeck's uh, biography? Oh, yes, certainly. And I enjoyed both his book on Lovecraft as well as his story, Submission, very greatly. I think it was prescient. In his essay on Lovecraft, he quotes one of my favorite passages in all of Lovecraft's work, which is from the Dunwich Horror, I believe. And uh, I don't have the whole thing memorized, but it, he says something to the effect of, Kadath in the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows Kadath? You should uh, look up the longer passage. I've tweeted it a couple of times because I think it's Lovecraft at his most King James and it's uh, it's I shouldn't say that. I'm going to leave it at that. Yes. All right. And then he had another question for you here. Margin Walker again says, thoughts on the art movement of uh, symbolism? I'm not sure exactly what that's referencing, but you might be. Um, I do not have... Yeah, I, I don't have any particular have any particular uh, interesting thought on symbolism, and I would suggest that if you want to hear some good right wing perspectives on particular artistic movements, you should talk to my friend Eo at Geo's Art Corner. He tends to be very knowledgeable about this stuff. About this stuff. Yes, and I'll actually uh, have, I'm probably going to have Gio on here next uh, week. Uh, he's, we're trying to set something up. Uh, so I'll definitely be talking to uh, him more. I want to have more uh, creatives on because I am just not, uh, I, am, I, I do not have uh, that skill set, but I know it's extremely important and something we need to cultivate more. And I, it's something I want to encourage and give people, you know, let, let, people who are doing that and exploring those spaces uh, really have a chance to, to talk to people, especially in our corner of the internet. Uh, because I, I just think, you know, like I said, there's, there's so many different aspects to kind of moving people and opening people up to new opportunities um, kind of on the right. Uh, but I feel like having those cultural outlets is just absolutely key as much as I love uh, you know, endlessly uh, going over uh, political theory. I always tell people at the end of the day, that's not the stuff that moves people's, uh, the average person's mind. It's the, certainly not the things that captivate them and, and kind of compel them forward to, to, to kind of change things and think differently. So I think it's extremely valuable to have guys like, uh, you know, you and Geo in those different fields, kind of opening that up for people. Yeah, thank you. I believe that storytelling really is the only way to change the uh, sort of the bios of, of the way people think. It's not really done through preaching. It's not really done through theory. That can reach a certain type of person. It can reach maybe a person who considers himself to be an intellectual the mass. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of those scenarios where it you you can throw all the theory and and you know uh, everything you want, all the systems analysis at someone you want, but really building it into a narrative and, and opening things up for someone like that it just moves them in an entirely different way, uh, which I, I think is really essential. It's you know we've. I'm sure we've all made this criticism a thousand times, but you know, the, the Ben Shapiro hypocrisy, uh, uh, you know, version of, you know, laying out all the facts and logic is so kind of useless in, in our moment, a moment where, you know, you can, you can destroy someone's every single argument and it really doesn't matter because you're not actually interacting 
with them on the level of, you know, their belief system or, you know, the way that they see the world. And so it, it really, you, you can, people, this is what drives me nuts with, with, uh, you know, the current pandemic situation, people will sit there and lay out statistics and, and, you know, effectiveness of different, you know, vaccines or infection rates or whatever thing, as if it, they, as if, if they stack up enough data, we won't get vaccine passports, you know, as, as if, you know, we get we get enough, uh, you know, data together and there won't be lockdowns pretending like that is actually where the argument is taking place, I think is is kind of silly at this point. Yeah, this is why the Bronze Age pervert strategy is so effective. He rarely tries to argue with data or with logic, but he uh, mogs people using aesthetics using a certain style of interaction he says you must submit and the maybe horrific thing to understand about that is that this actually works just telling people you must submit there's a certain number of people who just hear that and they think yeah you know what i will i will <laughs> that's terrifying in its own way yeah, well, but I think that's, you know, I think that's a big part of what, you know, uh, people will call themselves reactionary or, and then they'll uh, completely dismiss the power of something like what you just said there. You know, they they say, oh, well, if you didn't make the argument, you know, if you didn't lay it out logically, if you didn't, uh, you know, basically inform this unique and precious individual as to why all these certain things should work, then you, you didn't do this fairly or something uh, as if that's really, you know, what, what is happening in the world right now? Do do you guys really think that CNN and, you know, the New York times and, you know, the Biden administration are just laying out the most logical argument or, you know, are the, are these companies and these news organizations winning because they're just telling people this is how it's going to be and you have to do it. And there's just a massive percentage of the population that's going to say, okay. And it's, it's dangerous to the lesson to take away from that is thinking, well, we need to do the opposite. It's like, well, no, this is working for a particular reason and you need to understand that and, and, you know, factor that into your strategy and your approach rather than just hoping human nature is somehow different than what it actually is. Yeah, if you want to see kind of like the scenes in in the instruments of control, this observation is pretty banal, I think, for many people. But when you watch like a news broadcast and they talk about some event and you're supposed event and you're supposed to have a certain supposed to have a certain react have a certain re reaction. Well, I worry we may have had oh, You see it. No, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, your audio I cut off saying, really bad there. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start again. Uh, this option may seem a bit banal, but if you watch like an old broadcast from 9-11, playing was into the towers, and you'll see all the newscasters, their hair is messy, when they talk, they're out of breath. And there's no circumstance whatsoever that should make a guy in a newsroom be out of breath or have messy hair or anything like that. And it's just, it's, it's kind of a trite observation, but you see these little scenes in the way that the, the data is presented. They're telling you without telling you exactly how to feel and how to think at all times. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm not anybody who worked at a high level in media, but I am someone who, you know, uh, who wrote for newspapers and such. And, you know, we would get, you know, you'd get a poll and they'd send you the poll and you're supposed to write, you know, a story on it. And the poll is just prepackaged. It's, it's ready basically for you to change the words around and then just turn around with the conclusion they're handing you and move on. And the vast majority of reporters 
are never looking, you know, for they're, they're, they're lazy people and they're not going to bother uh, to do anything else. And so, the, you know, these low level functionaries who are just there to churn content, um, you know, they're, they're just taking that. And that's why so much of your news is the same. It's, it's all really getting handed down to all these different outlets by the same few uh, actual, you know, brokers uh, you've got an AP wire and, and, and some of these, uh, you know, think tanks or uh, these different departments and major universities. And they're literally just spoon feeding these reporters prepackaged stories. And then, like you said, when they come on and they do the performative stuff, if they're on air people, you know, they're, they're all taking those cues and delivering them, uh, you know, that you're, you know, like you said, there's, there's none of this is organic and none of this is, uh, you know, un, unbiased, just feeding you these things. They're, they're already pre, there's always already a way you're supposed to feel and it's already being delivered to you. Yeah, they're actors who couldn't make it in Hollywood. And all of their stories from, as you said, from about three organizations, there's associated, but these three organizations make all of the news. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we had uh, someone clarify on symbolism there. Symbolism was a reaction against technical and scientific progress with an emphasis on the irrational, as is most horror. Okay, well, that would definitely make sense why you had brought that up earlier. Thanks again for your support. I really appreciate that. Okay, uh, I, think... I can talk about that briefly. Uh, like... Oh, sure. Absolutely. Though I, I do have to be going soon. Uh, so I think I, I talked about this on another podcast, uh, which will be coming out soon with uh, Alex Mershock, I believe is his name. And there's sort of a schizophrenia on the right in that we have this, this reactionary uh, stance against technology in general, and because we often see it as a vector of the progress that we dislike. But at the same time, when we lament things like uh, dysgenic collapse, uh, IQ going down over time, despite what you know the Flynn effect tells us, we can find these sort of hidden oblique evidences that in some ways people have gotten a lot dumber um, one of the things we're lamenting is that we're losing the ability, maybe, to develop new technologies. So it's very There's a lot. So when I look for what I want the world to look like in the future, it's not a world where technology goes into remission. It's a world where we figure out how to save a patient by killing the cancer, but keeping the technology in some respects. Yeah, sorry, we lo I lost your audio around new technology, but I think I got the gist of what you're saying there. That that uh, need to find a way to keep what technology or keep technology while getting rid of what it's doing to the human being. Yes, exactly. If that's possible. Yeah, that's really interesting because that's something that's come up a little bit in my corner of the internet. Um, we had uh, someone kind of. A kind of posit that the technology is the call, the the problem and it's inextricable. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, I think that might be true. I know that makes me like a bad neo reactionary, um, but uh, but I have I have the instinct that that's correct. I'm not sure what to do about that, but I I don't know that it's escapable, and I don't know if it's something that we can't, that we can, I don't think that we have the discipline to stop ourselves. I don't know if that's a purely Faustian thing or if that's a, a human thing in general, 
but I don't think we do have the, the ability to throw the brakes on and, and then we're just going to kind of follow that to the end. Uh, though maybe that level of doomerism does make me a, a good neo reactionary. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think you're well within the dissident Overton window there. <laughs> uh, I would say that I'm at my most optimistic uh, when I try to reason about the idea that they have conflated technological development with social change and that these two things are not necessarily well they are linked but but the thing that they call progress is only one direction in social norm space and there are others that we could explore uh, I, I think that's fertile ground that needs to be explored if we're ever going to find uh, a way in to a right-wing techno future, if that, again, if such a thing is possible. No, I think that's that's probably true. Uh, I think you're right that absolutely the exploration has to happen. But I know you're running low on time, so let me get through these real quick so I'm not keeping you too long. Uh, Hunger here says, uh, I can only binge Zero's Twitter threads uh, once every three months. No one has broken my brain more than you, sir. Thank you for everything you do. Oh, thank you very much, Hunger. I, as you imagine, I get a lot of hate, but I also get a lot of love. And it is very encouraging to hear from you when you say those things. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your support as well, Hunger. And Charlemagne here, I knew that was coming. Uh, if technology is doomed, then we are doomed simple as. Um, and I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that one, uh, Charlemagne. <laughs> but, uh, no, me neither. I mean, aesthetically, that is sort of my jam. Right. Yeah, that's very true. That's, that's, a, that's a theme that, that certainly uh, go, goes through your work. All right, guys. Well, thank you uh, for coming by. Like I said, I know uh, Zero's uh, running low on time, so we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. But thank you for everybody who was commenting and super chatting and everything. I know we had a lot of uh, very cool people here with us today. Uh, uh, and make sure, of course, like I said, uh, if somehow you are not following uh, Zero HP Lovecraft on Twitter or if you are not reading uh, his stuff through uh, his WordPress, I've got all those links uh, below make sure that you do that before you leave and if you're new to my channel of course please uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe if this is your first time here uh, but i'm gonna go ahead and say thank you again to zero hp lovecraft and wish you guys all well thanks for coming on again man oh thank you and uh before i go if i could just make one sort of final note uh absolutely uh, my uh, physical hardback book uh, will be now, but I, I wanted to prepare people uh, that it will be something that you purchase through my publisher Canonic XYZ and that the transaction is you wish to purchase the book uh you will have my tremendous gratitude but i will be putting one additional uh, barrier to entry on that so please be advised that it will be purchased using uh bitcoin satoshi vision thank you Absolutely. So yeah, make sure you look for that. And I didn't say enough uh, about the the newest one, but uh, don't make me think it was uh, just released. I think you know about about a week, week and a half, and everyone should definitely be reading that. It's uh, it's very interesting. It's very different. Uh, so make sure that you check that out. Make sure you check out his uh, hardback uh, when it actually comes out. Thanks for coming by, guys. And as always, we'll talk to you next time.